Good morning. Good morning. I want to begin by thanking Dean Pat Malloy for inviting me to preach at the cathedral this Sunday. And I also want to commend those of you who had advance notice that I would be preaching today for still showing up. I bring you greetings from the Siemens Church Institute, a mission of the Episcopal Church, which for the past 189 years has been headquartered in Lower Manhattan down by Battery Park. And our mission as an organization is to improve the personal, professional, and spiritual well-being of seafarers and mariners both far and near. Years ago, when I was a much younger priest, I approached my then bishop in the Diocese of Chicago, and I asked if he would declare the last Sunday after Pentecost, sometimes known as Christ the King or Reign of Christ Sunday, but I asked the bishop if he would proclaim the last Sunday after Pentecost as Anglican Youth Sunday, which was catching on in the Anglican Union churches back in the early 2000s. And I'll never forget Bishop Purcell's response, which was, Mark, why can't we just let the last Sunday after Pentecost be the last Sunday after Pentecost? He then added, I really don't like to see Sundays become the church's equivalent of the disease of the week or the after school special of the week. So, with every fiber of my being, I am going to try to avoid turning this Sunday into the equivalent of C Sunday, that's S-E-A Sunday, which is a major event in the life of the Church of England, and I will endeavor to honor the assigned readings and to mark this Sunday as the 25th Sunday after Pentecost. So if you wish to learn more about the work and mission of the Siemens Church Institute, I hope you'll join me at the forum following this service just after we hear from the choir from St. Louis. Having said that, however, there are a few cheats that enable me to maybe sneak in a bit about my own sort of passions and agenda, and I'll just call them observations. For example, standing in this magnificent cathedral, I cannot help but notice how the very fabric and construction of this cathedral was dependent upon shipping and seafarers. In 1903, the eight giant columns over the main altar that support the roof above the choir were transported from Vinyl Haven, Maine to the Hudson River on a purpose-built barge towed by the steam tug, the Clara Clarita. The granite that forms the exterior wall, stone walls of the cathedral was shipped via seagoing barges from Maine, while the interior stone of Mohegan granite was shipped down the Hudson River via barges from the quarry in Peekskill, New York. Your original choir stalls were actually built and hand-carved in Germany in the 15th century and traveled to Manhattan via ship and then to this cathedral after making a brief stop at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And those massive bronze doors at the far end of nave, the entrance to this beautiful cathedral, were cast at the Barbadian studio in Paris and shipped via freighter to New York in the 1930s. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Even today, approximately 90% of everything that each of us uses in our homes and in this cathedral spent some time on a ship or barge. But now I fear I failed to keep my word, and I've strayed into that after-school special territory. So my apologies. So let's turn our attention to this morning's gospel passage from Matthew. It's called the Parable of the Talents. And we know from the context of the story that here a talent is not the ability to sing like Joyce DiDonato or Anthony Roth Costanza or to throw a football by Jalen Hurts, showing my affiliation with the city of brotherly love, or to drive a race car like Max Verstappen. Talent is an economic unit as a measure of wealth. Scholars tell us that each talent was roughly 15 years wages for a day laborer, an enormous sum of money. And in the parable, these talents are used to convey a truth 
and to hopefully make a greater point. Now, if this were simply a parable meant to glorify capitalism, then I could leave it, weave in another story about a young Dutch immigrant from Staten Island who bought a small sailboat and used it to transport passengers and freight from Staten Island to Manhattan, then built it into three major shipping companies, expanded into railroads, and died in 1877 with an estate worth $105 million, much of it generations later finding its way to support philanthropic organizations in New York, including a $100,000 donation to build this cathedral and even money for the Siemens Church Institute. Many of us know the story of Cornelius Vanderbilt, who indeed multiplied his talents. Unfortunately, this parable predates capitalism or even mercantilism. When this parable was told, the drivers of the Palestinian economy were dirt, by which I mean soil, and money lending, the latter of which was frowned upon. But let's dig a little deeper. In the telling of the parable, we notice that Jesus doesn't spend much time focusing on the success of the two slaves who double their master's talents. Jesus focuses most of, attention, most of his attention on the third slave, the one who buries his money out of fear of upsetting the master. By the time Matthew records this story, Christians had been waiting a very long time for the second coming of Christ, and they were getting anxious, but also many of them were becoming complacent. From Jesus' perspective, this third slave, the one who buries the talent, has become lazy. He didn't even bother to give it to the bankers to earn his master interest. He was afraid and out of fear buried it and waited for the master to return. And when the master does return, this third slave does not fare particularly well. So, if this story isn't about excelling at something like singing, or about making a killing in the stock market, then what is the point of the story? Well, one explanation is that Jesus is telling us to use what we are given to make the world better and to not let our fear stand in the way. Now, I venture that this passage of scripture is not most Christians' favorite passage from the Bible. It probably doesn't even break into the top 50. So I was surprised to discover that the recently installed stained glass window at Trinity Wall Street, just down the road, the window that presides over Wall Street, takes as its inspiration the parable of the talents. And in choosing this text for the window, the meaning of the story is that each of us is not only a steward of what we have been given, but we are also stewards with great responsibility. The idea being that each of us here today has been given something, our own talent, but something that we can use to spread God's love and to lighten the burden of others. Yet often, fear holds us back. And I get that. We are inundated with horrific images from Gaza, Israel, and Ukraine. We worry about the tension between China and Taiwan. Or closer to home, we mourn the news from Lewiston, Maine, or even the significant challenges right here in Manhattan. Why wouldn't we be cautious, self-protective, afraid? But if fear controls us, if we let fear control us, then we risk buying into a culture of indifference. We keep our heads down, put one foot in front of the other, bury our talent in the ground, and wait for the master to return, hoping for a different outcome. That's not very life-giving, is it? And following Christ is all about new life and living our best life with God's help. I think we are being called to use our talents to spread God's love to those around us while we wait. We keep our heads up as we look for opportunities to help those around us. This morning's gospel passage falls in between last week's story of the 10 bridesmaids 
in next week's story of the judgment of the nations. And Matthew may be on to something. Maybe he's helping us to better understand it. We are told to be prepared. Then we are told not to live in fear and bury what we have been given. And then we are told that how we served others is how we will be judged. Did we feed the hungry in our midst? Did we offer a cup of water to those who are thirsty? Did we welcome the stranger or clothe the naked or visit the sick or those in prison? I venture that if our answer is to no to all of these questions, then it is because we are letting fear hold us back. Our hearts become small, impoverished, because true poverty is a heart without compassion. Who are those in need of our love? Each of us probably has a different answer. In my world, it's seafarers and mariners far away from home and family. For you, it's probably a different answer. So in the end, how do we stifle our fears, lift our eyes, and see the face of Christ in all those around us? And then how do we use our talents to convey God's love for humanity and to make the world a better place for our having been a part of it?